you can learn how to eliminate these horrible GLP-1 side effects like nausea and diarrhea simply by learning how to microdose your GLP-1 medications. However, microdosing does not work at the onset for most individuals starting their GLP-1s. Proper execution is absolutely paramount if you want to see lifelong progress. So if you want to continue to reap the rewards of your GLP-1 medications and keep losing weight without necessarily having to always follow this cookie cutter template every single four weeks, increasing the dose, increasing the dose, then this is the video that you're going to want to pay attention to. My name is Dr. Jones, and I have the opportunity to coach thousands of patients just like you every single day in my community. My medical practitioners are the ones that are prescribing the GLP-1s, and I get to do the wellness and lifestyle coaching. Because a lot of you probably watching this video were told to increase your dose, needed to increase your dose, wanted to despite how horrible the side effects were because you wanted to get more results. Guess what, folks? There's something called proper lifestyle interventions. My gosh. Who would have thought that doing lifestyle with medication would get better results? We're going to crack the code in this video. Okay, so microdosing is such a beautiful concept. And I think it's very, very much sad state of affairs right now that we live currently in a society that it's very prevalent to me and probably many of you that censorship is happening right in front of us and certain accounts from certain people who also preach and spread a lot of the same message that I do uh, are getting shut down. And so it is the, I won't even get into any of that. I just want to, I want to continue to, to show you guys and teach you guys what I want to talk to you guys about, which is microdosing. So microdosing is a concept in the GLP-1 space of using lower doses of GLP-1 medications. Now, proper microdosing is actually utilizing very, very low doses. We're talking fractions of the amounts that are being used normal and normally in traditional settings. So we have to understand that microdosing isn't something as simple as let me take a microdose and expect to get an effect, the desired effect. The desired effect is feeling appetite suppression, reducing insulin resistance, reducing inflammation, and all sorts of other amazing benefits that we can't even put our fingers on because we're continuing to learn more and more about these GLP-1 medications. But if, from what I can tell you, because I've seen so many patients on these medications and I'm, and I'm coaching them with lifestyle and I'm watching what's happening... The individuals who can respond to much lower doses are metabolically more fit. They're metabolically more sound. They're not as inflamed. They're not as busted. They're not as insulin resistant. And, uh, you know, they're more metabolically flexible. And so because of this, it's, a, it's as if the medication doesn't have to override an existing dumpster fire of inflammation and, and, and problems. And so a very unique situation that the literature has not looked at would be utilizing these medications on people that are almost optimal, almost ideal. I mean, cause that would be the use case of them at all. Cause if you are extremely optimal and body fat percentages at a great level, inflammation is controlled, very insulin sensitive yet you'd have no need to use these medications, nor should you. Maybe if you're looking for the other, uh, long laundry list of amazing benefits, we can have that conversation, but if we're talking about weight loss right now and metabolic health, you probably wouldn't in that scenario, but let's be real, 99.99999% of the world is not there. So for the rest of you guys, there are definitely some of you that are near optimal, close to optimal, where a true micro dosing protocol could be a very powerful thing. So definitely talk to your providers, talk to your practitioners who are prescribing you if it's it's common practice by my practitioners if you're working with us this is what we do and this is what we believe in but if, you, if you're not working with us and you're somewhere else in the world then definitely have that conversation with your provider uh, and let them know that's what you want to try so of course if you're a diabetic that's a whole different story we're talking about it in the context of weight loss but there's this other concept besides microdosing that I want to talk to you guys about and this is more micro titration, if you will. I'm not sure exactly what I want to call it yet, but let's, 
let's go back and just make sure we can we understand uh, terms here and, and and ranges. So there's two active medications out there, active ingredients, semaglutide and terzepatide. Semaglutide is the active ingredient in Wagovi and Ozempic. Terzepatide is the active ingredient in Monjaro and Zepam. Okay. So, and, and terzepatide is, if you just want to get into a little bit of the, the differences, semaglutide is what we call a single agonist, hits the GLP-1 receptors. And terzepatide is a dual agonist, hits both the GLP and the GIP receptors. And so they're both great. Yeah, terzepatide is, is I've noticed, better. But semaglutide, don't poo-poo semaglutide. It's, it's still really good. And I'm bringing this up because access to compounded terzepatide is probably going to be gone here in the very near future with Eli Lilly recently mentioning that the national shortage from their end is over. Of course, everybody else is like, what the hell are you talking about? Because <laughs> so many people can't get their hands on Zetbound and Monjaro, but nonetheless, that's just what Eli Lilly said. So dosing wise, when it comes to terzepatide, 2.5 milligrams every four weeks, doubling the dose is sort of that cookie cutter template, which gets modified from there. So semaglutide is 0.25, and then same concept every four weeks, doubling the dose. So 0.25, 0.51. And then I've seen, you know, not necessarily going straight to two, 1.5, same thing with terzepatide. Uh, In fact, terzepatide, you can't even double that uh, 10 milligram dose. But in any case, it doesn't actually translate 10 for one exactly. But that's that's the general concept, doubling the dose every four weeks. And so what we've noticed and what we're doing, my, my practitioners are seeing, you know, when I report back to them after the coaching sessions, is that we're having patients that would start at the standard doses because we're, we're taking obese patients, metabolically busted patients. They're not going to respond to those micro doses like we just talked about. So we're taking those patients and we're putting them on the typical starter doses. But from day number one, when they join our coaching program, we're making massive changes. And I'm going to talk to you guys about what those changes are here in a little bit in their health. They're, they're, we're changing their diet right away. So they're eating less processed foods. They're eating less carbohydrates. We get them on an intermittent fasting protocol right away. We get them weight training. We put them on a good supplement regimen to address any micronutrient deficiencies, uh, essentially just making sure they're getting their vitamins, their minerals, and all the things that their bodies require. We are doing th- whatever we can to dampen inflammation. So a big one, for example, if you have an autoimmune disease or an inflammatory condition like PCOS, we're using something powerful like low dose naltrexone. Uh, if finances allow for it, we do powerful peptides like BPC-157. So we're addressing inflammation. Uh, we are checking hormones, sex hormones, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, and thyroid. Thyroid is the biggest one, and testosterone is secondary. So we're balancing out hormones if we need. We're also looking at cortisol, stress, and sleep, because while I'm working down this list of most prevalent to least prevalent, stress and sleep issues is still a huge problem. And we've had many people not get the results that traditionally our patients get until we fix this issue, one of these issues. And then finally, proper mindset. And so these are, these are what I call the 10 pillars of lasting weight loss. And so it's important that we address these things. But my point here is because we're addressing these so quickly right out the gates with our patients. Many times, this has been so, so awesome. I'll, I'll do my first coaching call with patients and they're like, Dr. Jones, I've been watching you on TikTok live and uh, I've already started fasting. I've already started implementing the things before your videos and I'm so excited. And you know, I've already started losing weight. It's very, very uh, common occurrence for me because most of you guys are joining me from either YouTube or TikTok live. And uh, which I, I fucking love that. That's so cool. That's so cool that the message of, of what I'm trying to communicate is, is getting out there. So that means the world to me. And your guys' feedback always uh, means so much to me. So people are either starting at the same time with their GLP-1 or they're starting this lifestyle before. And oh my gosh, shocker, when you do these other things, you don't need to increase your dose. I mean, I have patients that have literally, and we're talking obese patients. You know, we, we don't only work with the obese market. We work with metabolically busted, which could be, 25 pounds overweight, it could be 200 pounds overweight. So we work with all, 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 all types and uh, a significant decrease. This is an important concept here, guys. 
we are seeing a significant decrease in the need to increase doses that many of you guys are accustomed to, that you're personally in the middle of, or you've already done, or you've read and have seen the cookie cutter templates that we talked about, what research shows needs to be done. You know, I've had these conversations with so many practitioners and, you know, a lot of them are in disbelief, but a lot of them understand the concept. And then a lot of them are also doing it too as well. And they're in full agreement with, with what I'm preaching. And so, you know, it makes a lot of sense when you think about like, what are we, like, what are we doing here? What are we accomplishing? Why are GLP-1 medications so powerful? They're so powerful because they, I, I, I'm, I'm careful with the word instantaneously, but they instantaneously in a sense of when you get to a large enough dose, which for many people, it's the first dose for us, but they very quickly make some decreases in insulin resistance and inflammation. And by doing that, since I'm here proposing this concept, this theory, that insulin resistance, which creates hyperinsulinemia, and we're going to get into all this here in a bit, um, is the basis of obesity, is the basis of weight maintenance resistance, and I call weight maintenance resistance the uh, inability for you to maintain weight loss. This is all driven by insulin resistance and inflammation. And so, yeah, these medications are freaking amazing because that's what they address but they don't only just address that, they also suppress appetite. And you know you gotta be in a caloric deficit to, to, to initiate weight loss, but your hormones have to be optimized, specifically insulin. Trust me when I say this, you don't want your hormones working against you. You want your hormones working with you, or I like to say, get your insulin working for you because it makes things, in many cases, a reality but also in many cases, it just makes it significantly easier and much more smooth. And you know, this microdosing concept, this is very prevalent in the naturopathic and holistic space. Many doctors subscribe to this concept of when looking at hormones and medications, using the lowest dose possible. Our practitioners do the same thing when it comes to hormone therapy. Let's, let's talk testosterone therapy, for example. You know, many clinics will put uh, women, for example, total testosterone levels up to 150 or 200 or men's testosterone levels up to 1300, 1400. And, and, you know, when it comes to men, you can make a good argument because men's total testosterone reference ranges used to go up that high 50, 60 years ago. And that's a whole nother problem with men's testosterone scores plummeting. So you can make the argument of why that's ideal, but I personally and my practitioners agree we shouldn't be chasing numbers on a lab when it comes to hormones we should be chasing symptom resolution and really we should be asking ourselves well what's the lowest amount of testosterone that we can give to a man or a woman to handle their symptoms well if we're asking that question then the secondary question is well what else can we do to also achieve symptomatic resolution holy crap if i got somebody with a big belly and lots of visceral fat and they're overweight and they're inflamed. And if we can get them to make lifestyle changes and improve those symptoms, my gosh, is it possible that the testosterone would be more effective? The testosterone will be more effective. Uh, we know that. We know that testosterone levels and hormones, sex hormones, in many cases, improve without even giving the individual hormone therapy. But despite this, we are still a fan of utilizing hormone therapy in most cases, because even with the improvement that you get from just simply fixing insulin resistance and metabolic health, it doesn't get our hormones up to the ideal and optimal level in most cases, some cases it does, but in many cases, what it does is it lowers the threshold. It puts the body into a much more primed state where it's as if the receptor sites for testosterone are, are better, more efficient, which makes sense because we've seen in many cases where inflammation sort of murks up and dampens the receptor sites for various medications and, and various hormones. So this concept isn't so far esoteric. And uh, I just kind of wanted to give you guys another example of, of when using lower dosing, lower doses or micro dosing uh, can, can be very beneficial and, and when you can actually see it, at least in our practice, um, in, in actual practice. So the cookie cutter template every four weeks, just increase the dose 
you know, you might be wondering, like, why, why do they do that then? If you're saying that it doesn't need to be done, then why is it done? Great question. And the answer is simply that most people are not doing proper lifestyle interventions. Society hasn't even adopted a uniform agreement between what proper lifestyle intervention is. I think the only lifestyle intervention of my 10 pillars that I think everybody agrees on is eating less processed foods. I would say most people are not arguing about the consumption of processed foods and whether or not it's a good thing for you. So we all know that. Fortified Cheerios with multivitamins are not good for you. And I think nobody's arguing for Cheerios to be a hearty breakfast anymore. So, or Frosted Flakes for that matter. They're not great. (laughs) That's my horrible attempt here to uh, imitate Tony the Tiger. Anyways, so the reduction in your consumption of processed foods, we get it. We understand that this is something that we need to reduce. But everything else that we talked about earlier, that's not standard practice. In fact, some people even say you shouldn't do some of those things. You shouldn't lower your carbohydrate intake. You should have a hearty serving of carbohydrates in all your meals, guys. Bullshit. You should never do intermittent fasting. The human body was meant to eat five to six small meals every single day. We are snackers. The design of the body. Just, I just laugh every time I hear that. Ancestrally speaking, for millions of years, this is what humans had to do, whether by choice or not. And it wasn't by choice. They had to survive periods of famine. And it wasn't until the earliest humans were three million years ago. We, it wasn't until agricultural times 10,000 years ago did we actually have steady states of food. So eating all the time wasn't even a thing. Couldn't even be a thing until 10,000 years ago. And even then, we only ate three squares a day. It really wasn't until the, 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 the 70s that we started being told that you need a snack. And you know the whole reason for that was the crazy, crazy idea that uh, saturated fat and, and cholesterol cause heart disease and I talk about that in many other videos, but because of that, we made a switch. The government stepped in, made a decision for us, told us we we need to eat less fat. We need to eat less cholesterol. And because of that, well, that only leaves protein and carbohydrates. And that good old food pyramid that you guys remember growing up with is what was the result. Now, you know, was that in conjunction with big, big processed foods company? Yeah, you know. Uh, you guys let me know what you think. Maybe it was complete random and it wasn't a coordinated event. (laughs) But anyways, so when they're doing these research studies, they're doing it on normal people and they're doing it on normal people doing normal lifestyle interventions. Normal lifestyle interventions are far from what we do on patients and far from what most functional practitioners and holistic health doctors understand needs to be done in order to achieve lasting weight loss. So because you got your standard American eating your standard American healthy diet, yeah, they're not getting the benefits that we talked about earlier. And so the need for the weight loss to happen in order for the results to be successful from GLP-1 medications, there is this need for most people to bump their dose up, bump their dose up and continue to increase the dose. And there's also this concept that obesity is a chronic irreversible disease, that diabetes, you want, you know, it's a disease. You'll never get rid of it. The best thing you can do is manage it with medication for the rest of your life. That's a shitty prognosis. And it's just not true. You know, I, again, ask any functional practitioner and they'll tell you, I have a laundry list of patients who have successfully beaten and reversed obesity and diabetes. It's just a fact. The American Diabetes Association has it on their website, Criteria for Diabetes Reversal. Now, whether you want to say reversal or remission, that's a fair conversation. I would take it even if it's remission because, okay, fine. And that's probably where I honestly lean towards, that chronic disease goes into remission, not reversal. And and what does that mean? What's the difference? Remission means you're probably more sensitive to returning back. You have to be more on defense and put more effort to protect the newly found health that you gained, your body is going to desire to creep back in the other direction comparatively to somebody who's never been overweight or insulin resistant to begin with. I'd say that's a pretty fair statement. So 
getting back to the dosing, right? Getting back to how microdosing works, the concept of, of, of utilizing lower doses. I want you guys to really understand this, okay? So my basis um, and my theory and understanding is insulin resistance is the culprit, the main culprit. And, and it's the main culprit because insulin resistance creates hyperinsulinemia. So, so let's get some definitions here. Let's get some understanding. So insulin resistance is a condition in which your body's response to insulin is no longer as effective. So you're not responding to insulin as effectively. And as a result, your body produces more insulin to get the job done. Your body does this because, well, the function of insulin is that important. The function and job of insulin is to drive blood sugar levels down, to control your blood sugar, because high blood sugar will certainly kill you very quickly, by the way. Isn't that crazy that something as basic as old sugar, which we all eat a ton of every single day, too much in your blood will kill you. So your body's doing everything it can to keep blood sugar in a healthy range and an ideal range, and that's via the function of insulin. But when insulin resistance sets in, your body's only option is to just produce more insulin. So now you have this state of hyperinsulinemia. Well, again, what is insulin doing? Insulin is a storage hormone. It's a storage insulin-like growth factor. It's a growth signaling agent. Not only does it signal to store, 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 but it signals to grow, 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 grow. Both muscle tissue and fat tissue, all various tissues, most tissues in the body uh, can and will grow via signals of insulin, including cancer. And just to give you guys an idea, bodybuilders, which are very sensitive to insulin, will literally sometimes, depending on which crazy bodybuilder you're talking to, will even resort to injecting insulin to help them build muscle mass because of how powerful insulin can be. And they're insulin sensitive, right? They're not insulin resistant. So a diabetic person injecting insulin can certainly OD as well, but it would be much larger margin of accidental over-injection for them to, to do this because they're not, they're not sensitive, right? They're, they're very, very resistant. But a bodybuilder is extremely sensitive and so it ain't gonna take much for them to, to inject too much. So it's, I thought it was pretty crazy when I, when I found out bodybuilders were doing that a long, long time ago, but, and many of them still do. So I just wanna, I wanna drive that point home is that insulin is a very powerful storage hormone. So when someone tells you calories are all that matters and that hormones don't matter, they really don't understand science and they really don't understand what's going on here. And, and I have separate videos talking about this. So I'm, I'm going to be very brief. If you want a, a deeper dive on the whole calories versus hormones debacle as the basis of obesity, definitely check out my other videos. But in a nutshell, your body runs off signals. Hormones are very powerful signals that trigger and turn on certain processes and turn off certain processes. Insulin is a growth signal. Now, the whole idea of calories is that it, your body is simply a result of energy in versus energy out. And the truth of the matter is it's much more complex than that. Yes, that is a true statement when you're looking at the focal point of actually being in a caloric surplus or actually being in a caloric deficit. Yes, that's a true statement. But what many people fail to realize is what causes a person to be in a caloric deficit or not. Is it all a simple case of willpower? Put down the fork, fatty, stop eating, you know, get out there and exercise. We've been doing that shit and trying to do that for so many decades and it doesn't work. You know, and yours truly, I, I went through this myself because I struggled. I, I lost a hundred pounds and I couldn't keep it off for over a decade because I didn't know about the carbohydrate insulin theory of obesity. And so the things that I was doing did not focus on lowering insulin levels enough to beat the resistance, I simply just did a bunch of cardio and weight training and I ate less processed foods and I started eating six meals, small meals a day. I counted my calories, I counted my macros every single time I lost weight, but I couldn't maintain the amount of effort. It was like my body was working against me, which we explain this as the weight set point theory. So addressing the biggest studies out there, and this is where and I have a lot of respect for a lot of um, very intelligent people out there that will say, but the biggest studies done 
tell us that it doesn't matter about insulin. You can see right here, largest randomized control studies on the topic where they actually compared. They said, okay, let's control calories and let's have group A, you're in a caloric deficit, but let's try to lower insulin, you know, with fasting and keto. And the other category, let's not do that. You can eat, I'm sure not eat as much carbs as you want, but it was like a more of a standard representation, like 50, 60% carbohydrates, which is what we're told is, you know, totally the ideal way to approach this is eat that many carbs. And weight loss was the same. On the short term, when they studied these things, weight loss was the same. And to validate their point, their point being that hormones don't matter, they, they like to bring up the fact that these were very controlled studies. Metabolic wards are very expensive studies. It's essentially uh, a way to control the caloric intake. These people are in these facilities. They're monitored 24-7. So you literally can't undereat or overeat. It's a, it's a guaranteed way because a lot of calorie studies are self-reported. And so self-reported calorie studies, good luck. I mean, you, you, we all like to believe we're only needing 1,800 calories. Get the fuck out of here. Come on now. You know, it's only one tablespoon of peanut butter. It's like this massive chunk of peanut butter. <laughs> oh, self-reporting calories. Um, yeah, you know, this is... This is, this is one of the reasons from a calorie perspective why people don't actually lose weight is because they, they don't know how to actually report accuracy behind their calories. So self-reporting is awful. Metabolic wards are the ideal gold standard. So you might be thinking, well, then Dr. Jones, what's, aren't you proving yourself wrong here? Here's the thing. We don't have randomized control studies to prove my point. But what I'm attempting to convey here is I think the powers that be and the experts that I that I would love to get on a podcast with, uh, Lane Norton, Doctor uh, uh, Is- Mike I- Michael Israel, those are the two, the first two that come to my mind. There's a ton of like fitness coaches on social media that I just know they don't know what they're talking about. So I'd like to save my time for gentlemen that I or any any women. This isn't a biased thing. Those are the first two people that came to my mind that really do believe in the and strictly in calories. And I know they're referencing these studies because Lane even referenced these studies specifically. I actually read them after he referenced them years ago. And so I would love to be at a podcast with them because I do have so much respect for them. And and I'm always willing to be wrong, but please help me understand why my idea might be wrong. So what I'm trying to say here is research is only as good as our ability to interpret them, right? Right. Sometimes when you're interpreting research, it's very common sense. If I did a study on the effects of oranges on your metabolism, and then I ate an apple, well, I can't say, based off that study, I'm going to get the same result from the apple. Like, that's very common sense and very clear. Example of clear application of the research. But these studies... (laughs) I mean, it's, it's very clear to me, but I don't, I don't understand how certain people are not seeing what I'm seeing here. So these studies controlled the calories that people intook, right? What they, what they were intaking. We just talked about the reality of people's inability to actually adhere to caloric deficits or their inaccuracy to actually apply proper metrics to know and quantify how much they're eating. So look, there's a little thing called hunger. I wish I could sit there and override my hunger 24-7. Even with GLP-1 medication... Well, never mind. With GLP-1 medications, it's very easy. But without GLP-1 medications, it's very challenging. And so most people would not be able to adhere to the caloric deficit that they think they are adhering to. Uh, I mean, and maybe, they, maybe they're aware that they can't. They just can't override hunger. Guess what drives hunger up, folks? Hyperinsulinemia. It's very known effect that when you are hyperinsulinemic, you have a thing called food chatter. This is the, one of the very reasons why P- GLP-1 medications are working so good because the massively spiked hunger that comes, as we call food chatter, which is driven by insulin resistance. And so these people will not override their hunger. So they're never going to be able to get into the caloric deficit. So the irony here is the fact that these studies were so controlled is the very reason why I have so much confidence that we are not properly applying these studies to the real world. And I have one more piece to bring up too. We know very well that chronically elevated insulin levels can create down regulation from the thyroid. 
the thyroid can slow down and we call this starvation mode when you're not eating enough calories over a, over a period of time, caloric deficit. But having the hyperinsulinemic state can also contribute to that downregulated metabolism. In other words, the metabolism downregulates faster when you are in a caloric deficit while simultaneously being hyperinsulinemic versus not being hyperinsulinemic. This is your body working for you or your body working against you. And in this case, your body working against you. And so I hope this message gets out because I'm very willing to be wrong. I feel very confident. Obviously, you can't research your way to what I'm saying because my hypothesis, maybe you could, and I don't know how you would do that. But my current hypothesis is that we are misrepresenting or misapplying these very powerful, robust studies, which lead many people to think that hormones don't matter. It's all about getting into a caloric deficit and maintaining a caloric deficit. Let me know what you guys think about that. I know that was a long rant, but I just, I, I, it, it does relate to what we're talking about. We're talking about why microdosing can help or how you can achieve microdosing. How can you, how can you effectively benefit from GLP-1s while not utilizing such a high dose? And the way that we can do that is by fixing insulin resistance. And we just talked about some of the deleterious effects of chronically elevated insulin levels. So I pulled in here because I wanted to get a cup of coffee here. Oh, perfect. We do have an area to get coffee. Fantastic. Let's do that, folks. I sometimes like to chill out, grab a coffee, and uh, crack some work in. All right. I was able to knock out some emails there. I thought I was going to be able to do a little clip with you guys, but didn't work out. And that's fine. I got, what, hopefully another... 15 minutes with you guys here. So we understand the impacts of insulin. You guys also heard my, my big theory right now that is really monumental when you think about it in terms of what it would do for the entire perspective of the obesity space and the weight loss space and how many people are being told by experts that it doesn't matter and it's, you know, just focus on calories and why I think that's a very ineffective way, you know, <clears throat> uh, let's move on to back to how can we fix this with lifestyle? So what I have are a couple key strategies. So let's talk about processed foods. So again, we all understand we need to eat less processed foods. So I am a fan when I coach my patients of adhering to a 90, 10 rule. I ask my patients to keep 90% of their diet clean meaning unprocessed. We are avoiding ultra processed and we're avoiding processed and we're trying to choose our foods from fruits, vegetables, meats, legumes, nuts. It's not, it's not a large list. And uh, I like paleo Mediterranean, keep it mostly clean. I, that's, that's a good representation. And then on my second cardinal rule is reducing your consumption of carbohydrates. So this is keto or Adkins, or whatever it is you want to call it. But eating less carbohydrates, I think, is absolutely crucial because this is a powerful way to reverse insulin resistance. What's driving that insulin resistance state that we talked about is elevating insulin levels. Well, a ketogenic diet is a powerful way to lower insulin levels because you're not eating the very thing that causes insulin to secrete more than, than other macronutrients, calories, and protein. It's carbohydrates. And so eating less carbohydrates is vital in a very powerful uh, intervention. The data backs us up significantly. Carnivore, whole other conversation, could be life-changing. Ketogenic diet, I don't even expect you to be able to maintain that for life. So carnivore diet's even more unrealistic for you to maintain that for the rest of your life. And I even have questions about that. I'd love to be on a podcast with Dr. Ken Berry because I also, I just love, he's just a cool dude and I love what he's all about. And, uh, I, I do have some questions for him in terms of patient adherence to carnivore long-term, but, but nonetheless, you could do carnivore, you could do keto for two to four months. 
In many cases, you would need to do carnivore and keto for much longer to fix insulin resistance. But with my protocol, the fasting, which is the next thing we're going to talk about, is the most powerful piece of the equation here, the most powerful piece of the pie, which is why I believe you don't have to do keto or carnivore for as long to fix the broken insulin resistance. So let's get into fasting flow protocol. This is what I've created. This is my structured approach towards long fasting with flow. We are flowing, baby. Uh, this new uh, this new catchphrase uh, we are are saying now is "Go flow or go home" or uh, hashtag "Go with the flow." Anyways, you're not here to to listen to my boring slogans, are you? So, intermittent fasting, our daily approach towards fasting. Most of you guys are familiar with that. Most of you guys know this is like your daily eating window, compressing your eating every single day to eight hours. But the reality is that ain't going to do shit. That ain't going to do enough for most of you that are severely busted. It's a good start. It's a good maintenance tool. And it's still not even enough to maintain, in my opinion. But it's, it's, a, it's a starting point. We need to push the envelope. We need to get into prolonged fasting. So what, I, what flow is, what the basis is, is I created structure where structure was missing in the world of prolonged fasting. Because there was and still isn't any protocol of long fasting. You know, long fasting is, fasting by definition is the greatest caloric deficit you can get into. And we know that radical caloric deficits over a long enough period of time cause massive metabolic downregulation, right? They cause slowdown of metabolisms. So how is it that flow protocol is any different? What I figured out is the longest fasting period, which I think is around 36 to 48, that most people can do on a weekly basis. Because what's the increment of time here? We're not talking daily here. Weekly. Monthly is not enough. If we talk about what's the longest an individual can fast monthly, well, you're not going to get enough fasting in in the month on a monthly basis. So weekly made the most amount of sense. I was I was playing around with bi-weekly for a while. But weekly made the most amount of sense. And this was all trial and error with me way back in the day. I told you guys earlier that I, you know, for over 10 years, for about 10 years, I kept losing and regaining the same 50 pounds. Uh, And it was fasting and then eventually long format fasting that for me provided me the first time in my life, real stability, real ease because I fixed the insulin resistance. So the, the longer form fasting on a weekly basis is what I put together in this protocol. So we are, that's what flow is. We are getting you in. We are getting our patients into a weekly long fast of say 36 hours, 48. Now, before you shout out Dr. Jones, you're a madman. You're crazy. How in the world could I do that? Which is what I get asked a lot. Sometimes we got GLP one medications. Calm down, homie. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, the, the GLP-1 medications, semaglutides, the terzepatides, the soon-coming retitrutides, the tesofensines, which is not a GLP-1 medication, but another powerful appetite-suppressing uh, medication, they really do help. They really do make it much easier for this to happen. And the second piece of the equation that I think is absolutely vital is fat mobilization, fat mobilizing peptides. So my favorite to add is AOD9604. So AOD9604 is actually a fragment of the human growth hormone. And specifically what it does is it mobilizes body fat. So when you are insulin resistant, your body is very, it struggles with its ability to access stored body fat. This is why we know insulin resistance and diabetics, which is late stage insulin resistant, they're tired Their body is always hungry, craving energy. They can't tap into the energy they have. They're fatigued. They're brain foggy because that's what growth would require. Your growth signal wouldn't want you to expend energy. Your growth would not want you to utilize energy. Your growth would want you to take that energy and put it in the bank, grab that money, throw it in the bank, close at the doors. You can't access it, right? That's a very energy preserving approach. And that's what insulin does. And that would, that's why insulin is so effective at causing and creating growth. So when you're insulin resistant, you are very poor at doing this. And we call this skill fat adaption. We call this 
metabolic flexibility. We're saying the same thing here. We're talking about your metabolism's ability to burn fat effectively. Well, burning fat first requires this, the initial stimulus, which is the caloric deficit, and then it requires the skill of being able to effectively mobilize the fat. Otherwise, it stresses your body out. It's still got to burn the fat, but a mobilization decreases the stress load on your body, and we know how too much stress can be a problem. And so we're essentially making it less stressful and more viable, more efficient. And this is a big deal, especially for women, because women struggle with long rounds of fasting sometimes during certain parts of their 28-day cycle. Men, long fasting, much easier because you have a 24-hour hormonal cycle. Women, you have a 28-day cycle. And so day 13 to 15, day 18 to 28 are certain stages of your cycle in which longer rounds of fasting or really anything cortisol spiking, any stressful situation creates problems and you feel like crap. So the stress load is reduced with something like AOD. This is A lot of this is quoting Dr. Mindy Pels, another individual that I look forward to working with at some point because uh, I've learned a lot from her and I'd love to share with her what I'm seeing with my women who are successfully fasting. And, I, and I've tested this out with AOD without. Even on GLP-1s, it makes it easier. But the addition of AOD on GLP-1 versus no AOD, no growth hormone peptide, because growth hormone peptides like samorolin, tesamorolin, CJC-1295, ipomorelin can also give that fat mobilizing effect, which decreases the stress on the body. And women want that on, on day 18 to 28, the progesterone phase. They want to protect their progesterone and cortisol robs you of the progesterone and, you know, really just makes you feel like crap, women. And so, yeah, we have a lot of success with, with women doing that. And uh, same thing with autoimmune patients, sensitive to stress when you have autoimmune flare-ups, for example, and AOD minimizes the stress load and makes it easier. So I think, truthfully, fasting is the most powerful tool, the most powerful intervention that we have. I want to cover weight training. Weight training is vital, I would say, more so for your ability and more so for the likelihood and reality that you're actually going to maintain, that you're actually going to maintain the weight long term. That comes from the maintenance of muscle mass loss. So with any weight loss program, you are going to experience weight loss. And with that weight loss, you're going to experience muscle mass loss. So how can we reduce the amount of muscle mass that you're losing? We can perform solid weight training, hypertrophy style resistance training, which is essentially the same way you would train if you were actually trying to gain weight. If you were trying to put on massive amounts of muscle and cause the scale to go up, you would put yourself in a caloric deficit. You would increase your percentage of protein intake, probably spread the protein out throughout the day too as well. And you would also perform a larger volume of hypertrophy style training, I would also tell you if, that's, if this was your goal to optimize your testosterone, get your testosterone levels checked out, consider growth hormone peptides to optimize the growth hormone, and that's what we would do. Well, we're not trying to gain weight on the scale. We're trying to lose weight. We're trying to lose fat, but you want to protect as much muscle mass as you possibly can. So you take the same style of training. You take that same style of hypertrophy training. And you apply that way. A lot of weight loss programs will recommend more of this circuit style, aerobic based, maybe even CrossFit style. Although CrossFit, I've seen all sorts of wild variations of it. But, and I'm not saying those are bad, but they won't protect your muscles as much as hypertrophy style would. Now, those ones would cause you to burn a ton of calories. That's what they would say. And they'd be true. But you're doing flow protocol. You're doing flow fasting. Hopefully, if you're watching this video, you're going to start. And you're going to burn enough calories from the 36 to 48 hour fasting. Trust me, you don't need to worry about burning more calories. Like that's the cool thing about this. That's the nature of this. That's why it's so awesome is because you're not going to have to screw around or worry about any of that burning calorie nonsense. You're burning enough calories. You're getting all the amazing benefits of fasting. You just got to focus on kicking ass in the gym and protecting the muscle mass, protecting the muscle mass that you have. And by doing that, that keeps your metabolism primed because muscle is very metabolically active tissue as well. You burn more calories at rest, the more muscles mass you have on your body, which is also really awesome. It's just a much more favorable situation. And it only takes three to four days, 45 minutes, solid weight training where like, so what does it actually look like? What does it actually consist of? You need to push yourself each repetition 
to complete muscular failure. So for example, kind of difficult here, if you see me moving here, I'm doing like a chest press here. I mean, it's probably be easier if I'm, if you imagine I'm doing a lat pull down. So I got the bar and I'm pulling down. My lats are, are cranking, they're, they're contracting and pulling my humerus, my arm bone down. And after a certain amount of repetitions, you feel a burn. Well, muscular failure means you are mentally pushing yourself beyond the initial pain point, the initial pain threshold, and you're pushing, 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 pushing till you can't handle any more pain or till you physically can't move. That's muscular failure. Now look, in the first couple of weeks of starting your weight loss journey, you don't have to go that crazy. You don't have to go that hardcore. You do anything the first couple of weeks, you're gonna get results. But weight training needs to be systematic and progressive over time because your body's always trying to adapt. The literal act of weightlifting is supposed to create micro traumas and tears in the actin and myosin filaments and it's the it's that stimulus itself that triggers the healing response where you have stem cells that go there and grow and proliferate and you have an increase in an actual size of your muscle fibers. That's why your muscles get bigger. So we want that, but your body's always trying to adapt and prevent that from happening. So this is the need, this is why there needs to be a systematic and progressive increase and in improvement. And the progression is the need to increase the weight. This is what you hear about, but it doesn't have to be weight per se, but weight is the easiest way. You try to move the, the weight up on your weightlifting or whatever machine maybe you're using or dumbbell you're picking up. But there's many other things like form and tempo and range of motion. So we're gonna we're gonna put it all together. So reaching muscular failure. Are you reaching muscular failure at 25 reps? At five reps? At 15 reps? They're very different, right? If we did the same exact lift at the same exact speed and everything else was isolated and we just changed the weight, it would dramatically change the amount of repetitions that you could perform. And so setting up the exercise via weight so that you can achieve muscular failure somewhere between eight to 12 repetitions is the most optimal way for hypertrophy gains, right? If you reach muscular failure at five, that's the best for strength. And then if you're reaching at 15 plus, that's the best for aerobic uh, capacity. And there's a little bit of crossover, mind you, for all of it. But the hypertrophy focus is eight to 12. Now, before anybody gets out there and, and pulls a muscle or tears a ligament and says, Dr. Jones, you told me to lift heavy and now I'm in the hospital, you dick. Before that happens, weight does not have to be the actual main variable. Inevitably, you're going to have to increase the weight, but tempo and range of motion are also very powerful variables. So tempo refers to the speed of which you are performing the lift. And so simply slowing down your tempo and you know, we can get into the nuance. You have your concentric, you have your eccentric, and then you have isometric. If you were holding the bar and it's trying to go up and you feel your muscles burning, we can get into separate videos where I get into the nuance of those, but just simply moving slower will definitely cause you to reach muscular fatigue faster. And then full range of motion is always ideal. And I got to thank Ben Patrick, the knees over toes guy for really bringing this to light to me over the last few years where I won't even train anything strength wise without going through the full range of motion because strength over range of motion, in my opinion, is now from what I understand how you promote longevity and how you protect against injury. Whole nother conversation there, but moving your muscle through the entire range of motion that you can, that doesn't aggravate a potential injury is also how you can achieve muscular failure with lower weight. So for a lot of you guys that are starting out there, I would actually try to use, I would create a game for yourself. If you have injuries, if you don't have injuries and you want your ego is want you want to lift more than fine but for everybody else that you don't give a shit about how much you're lifting you're, you're doing this for health or you are worried about injuries but you want to do this then the game needs to be how can i reach muscular failure while using the lowest weight possible and only increasing the weight when i need to if i can't go any slower and i can't increase the range of motion anymore and i'm already at 15 reps for example because i've been increasing my reps every single time i perform next week when i go back and do it again or in, in three days if you're doing a full body routine every three days so i wanted to give you guys a really good understanding of that there's so many more pillars and i'll do separate videos just talking about the pillars of lasting weight loss but i hope that gives you guys some good understanding about taking a step back just looking at the big picture using the lowest dose possible to me that's that's the the best practice for medications and hormones in general and we have been doing this very successfully in our clinic we service all 50 states guys just so you know so if you are looking to achieve lasting weight loss I'll give you guys a link in the bio to schedule a free consultation with us but definitely i uh, hope you guys enjoyed this and if you guys did enjoy this video looking at the big picture talking about how we can microdose check this video out there it's a much deeper dive into the peptides specifically how we utilize them to enhance your results we'll see you guys later